Yes, welcome to The Disruptors, where we get the people focused on building a better future. Today, we've got Richard Brion on the program. Richard, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. So Richard, you're focused on building a better world, primarily through what we eat and how we do it. Tell me a little bit more about the future of Agritech. So agriculture is uh, suffering from a couple of major problems around the world. Uh, one of the first is that we're losing our arable land. Uh, world Bank projects that we're losing about 29.7 million acres of arable farmland around the world each year, which for those that live up in the Seattle, Washington area, that's about half the size of the state of Washington every year, an arable land that's just being diminished. Regardless of your politics on why you think that might be, that's just things that are happening. So what we're trending towards is uh, with population increase and that urban land or that arable land problem, we're looking at a 50% need for more food while seeing a 25% decrease in production by 2050, according to the World Bank. Um, so that's one of the problems that we're seeing in the world is we need more food from the land we already have or we need to figure out something else. And then the other interesting issue that agriculture is seeing is around the world, the younger generations are exiting traditional farm type labor jobs. They're leaving for other reasons. Uh, the job isn't paying enough. It's considered to be heavy work without enough pay or it doesn't fit in with the way they see the world changing. So we're seeing a lot of gen multi-generational farms where the kids are leaving the farm to go get an education and aren't coming back. And that's true from here in the United States all the way to Afghanistan. I was just there in 2018. And even their farmer, farming communities are seeing their children leaving and get education and aren't coming back to their own farms. So that's kind of where we're heading in the world in terms of agriculture as a, as a whole. Do we need that much more production if we fix the spoilage problem? Um, I mean, that's a, that becomes a um, question of, uh, what would be the best way to put that? That becomes a question of- Giving a shit? Well, that and also if we solve the spoilage problem, is it still getting to the right places? Because where that spoilage is occurring is where uh, along the supply chain because our supply chains are super long and complex. So um, China's importing a ton of food. We're losing a lot there. The U.S. is importing a ton of food. But what about to even the communities right here in Washington State where people don't live close enough to a grocery store? They're getting their produce from someplace else. So production is still something that needs to be addressed along with that complicated supply chain. Um, getting rid of the spoilage and the imperfect produce model does definitely help. And that might reduce some of that percentage, but we're still going to need to see greater um, production because the population is increasing faster than uh, we can handle as well. What's the future for production? Is it big scale, small scale, some type of mix? <laughs> Again, that depends on your school of thought. Uh, the traditional chemical agricultural community will say that um, just large scale production, uh, a lot of the uh, venture backed uh, agricultural companies also believe in bigger is better. I kind of think that um, smaller is going to be the way forward because uh, for a number of reasons smaller production that's still high or smaller production plots that are still able to produce a lot in the same space because then we can actually farm closer to where the communities are and we can uh, get the food more locally which then reduces that spoilage problem in and of itself the further away we have to go the far the more chances we have of uh, food safety issues or spoilage along the route so how hard would it be to have a mega farm per city? Essentially, you, and you distribute farms around the country based off of where the population actually is, but you do it with semi-large scale agricultural methods. Um, so that still becomes a, a land problem. Um, mega farms still require space. A good example would be um, arrow farms are plenty. They still need warehouses about the size of Costco's. Uh, look at these large uh, cities that have issues already. Washington, D.C. comes to mind. It took them forever to get a Costco because they couldn't figure out where to put it. Um, and that's only a few thousand square feet or a few hundred thousand square feet. Um, so 
as our population density increases and people start and people continue to um, see urbanization rates in the way that we have, that pushes people out onto the land that's available. And then as that land gets taken up, then it moves it again and again. And pretty much you're going to have a large few hundred thousand acre mega farm now 600 miles away from the city just because of the way the urban sprawl kind of um, happens. How do you think about vertical farming, hydroponic, aquaponics? Um, so I think that they are definitely part of the um, solution and our uh, company's solution is based uh, largely on an aquaponic system, but that there, there are constraints in the system that have uh, in those systems that prevent them from being a complete solution. Uh, the, one of the largest being is crop selection. Um, hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics, they're pretty much current under current systems are limited to producing things that turn over quick, highly commoditized products that don't, um, that can have, that don't have a flavor profile change as a result of not being grown in soil. So you get your lettuces, your, leafy greens, your microgreens, things that most people don't notice a flavor difference when they eat a crop grown in the ground versus crop uh, grown without soil. And that whole um, soil argument has become to the forefront now where they just had the um, big push to see if uh, aquaponic and hydroponic farms shouldn't be allowed to have organic certification because they're not being grown in the terra or in the soil of the earth directly the hydroponic and aquaponic farmers won that battle, but there's still people that say that you can't be truly organic if you're not using that soil-based compound, and that's the problem with those current systems. That, seem, that seems like flawed reasoning because A, organic is what you don't add, and B, you essentially the reason why people are arguing this is they want the, you want to have the micronutrients coming in from the, the bacteria in the soil, et cetera, but I'm sure you got quite a bit of dead animal bacteria that's happening in the in the water where aquaponics are happening. So wouldn't you have similar effects? Well, yes. Yeah, so I I agree with you in from the aquaponic base that saying that if it's not grown in terra firma, then it's not organic. I I don't agree with that logic. Um, aquaponically, I think that that would be better from a for an organic certification because you're still using a natural fertilization you're using animal animal in solution that's from fish waste that is then pumped through no different than using any other animal fertilizer hydroponics becomes a trickier question because the nutrient it was sterilized and you so yeah you don't uh you don't have that organic matter in it you're also using some sort of synthetic base to create your micro micronutrient solution so you know, it uh, that becomes a question I would leave to the academics on if hydroponics should be. I kind of think aquaponics deserves to be allowed it, but there still are the the purists that believe that without terra firma, then it shouldn't be allowed to be considered an organic growing solution because it's not within the organic material of the earth. Now, are they flawed? Perhaps, but you know, it's still an argument, and that's what makes humans humans, right? Do you, think we'll always, do you think we'll always be like that? What about clean meat? Is it going to be lesser because I didn't go and shoot an animal in the head? Or if we can, if we can grow it, is it going to be the same if it tastes the same? Um, I, that, that's another tricky question there because uh, a clean meat product is, you're not, uh, it becomes that whole the original, at the original in, um popularity of the paleo diet it was very simply put if you can pick it or you can kill it you can eat it so they were trying to get away from that heavily cultivated kind of thing now would the meat be considered cultivated at that point and then less pure i don't i, I don't know um do i think that uh humane conditions of animals for eating is important i i think so and i think that uh the some hunters will tell you the same when you go hunt a wild boar or wild pig you try not to kill it when the adrenaline's up or when it's panicked because it spoils the taste of the meat a lot of them will use dogs to capture the pig bring it back and then when it's not expecting it then they take the life of the pig so that that adrenaline doesn't spoil the meat so again this becomes a question of um what's your what's your personal opinion on 
the way that we handle these things in, in life. And I'm kind of a bit of a, of a weird person when it comes to all those things. I think that um, we need to be sustainable in how we do things, but also there is a, there's a beauty to doing things that were done hundreds of years ago as well. Cause some of the, I mean, aquaponics started with the Mayans, you know, long time ago, they figured out that they could build um, little water pods from the river with land above it and they could grow food right like that. And that was no technology. It was an old way to do things. And I think that there's a beauty to that as well that we need to consider when we're looking at our technology. How does an ex Navy guy get into farming with water? <laughs> uh, maybe the water is the connection. Um, but it, uh, it was an interesting path. So I spent time in Afghanistan um, and then uh, part as a DOD contractor as well, chasing the opium problem that uh, the United States was doing. We were training Afghans on counter opium and U.S. policy at the time when I first started was we'd find the farms and we'd burn them to the ground, which turns out to create one of those by trying to solve one problem, we create another. Um, yeah, we, we were talking about this earlier. What do you think about the whole yeah. drug, drug war? I, I think that oftentimes it's one of those to try to solve one problem, we create another. It, uh, it has a lot of unintended consequences that we think morally are better. Um, and then there's been a lot of changes over the years in the way certain countries are handling it and they seem to have better results. Portugal comes to mind. Um, but yeah, so that I was doing, I started out seeing the, we called it counter poppy eradication. We'd go find the farms and we'd burn them down. And then those, those farmers were growing the only crop that they could grow in large volumes that made them money. And then because of the way that Afghanistan sits, it's logistically a nightmare to get anything in and out. So the illicit value chain was bringing everything to these farmers. All they had to do was grow and harvest and everything else was almost a convoluted version of just in time manufacturing. Everything was then pulled through by the illicit value chain members to where all, you had the farmer on one end that just grew it and the people in the middle that pulled it all the way through to the final customer. So these people were just kind of doing what they could to survive. And here we were burning their only, only livelihood down. So then we came up with the brilliant idea of let's pay them to grow something else, which was corn or grains. Um, and in spite of what we were doing, we were spending millions of dollars to, cha to train them to, to change their farming practices for one reason or another. It didn't change the perception of the product. So no one was buying it from them. So now these farmers are sitting on just tons of grain. What do we do with it? Well, if they're not making any money, we risk running them back to the illicit value chain. So then we were spending millions of dollars to buy the grain and then we had to burn that because no one would buy it. So that's what started me on the path of there's gotta be something better for these types of communities that don't have a lot of option to grow crops that can be eaten or that people want to buy. And, that's what started me looking at growing with water or recirculating systems. I started looking at hydroponics and then aquaponics because of the fact that it had some other, what I saw as perceived advantages in other ways. And then such as, um, so I see the, um, the natural fertilization, the symbiotic environment within the aquaponic system, while it creates complication from, a uh, having to make sure that everything's running, you have a protein source being grown alongside of your food source or your produce source. So if you put these into these remote communities in um, Afghanistan or parts of Africa or even parts of Asia, you're being able to provide both a fresh crop that they don't necessarily um, have access to along with a protein source. And yes, so there might be some vegans or some vegetarians that might disagree with me on the importance of having a meat-based protein, but for a lot of these communities that I initially started looking at, meat-based protein is still important. And so being able to provide sustainable meat-based protein with sustainable food, that was a benefit that um, was greater in my perceived um, view of the world for these communities. And then um, to take it one step farther, 
uh, hydro, at least what I've seen from backyard systems, aquaponic systems over hydroponics are, can be more rudimentary, built out of local materials, wood, plastic, whatever's available, more so than the hydroponic systems. They're, so that again, that rudimentary ability to use very basic materials you can find almost anywhere in the world made them more adaptable to those conditions. One, you basically have to be able to build a meth lab. Two, you have basically have to be able to build a pond. Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, very simply put, that's exactly what it is. So then when I started looking at why it can't be a more complete system than just lettuce and why we're not, I started down a, a huge rabbit hole that landed us at uh, the New Mexico State University's egg sprint program. Uh, we were in their accelerator and having this discussion with one of their PhDs that there isn't, there wasn't a perceived way to effectively grow crops in an aquaponic system using soil and using indoor pollination because it, it couldn't be done. There's mathematic problems to it. There's drainage problems to it. And so that's kind of the path that we started taking down is, well, wait a minute. These sound like obstacles, not actual scientific reasons for it not working. And so that's where we started diving in. And the more I looked into why it was being done the way it was, the more I saw that there might be a need for someone to solve the problem. And that's how a Navy guy that spent more time in the desert than he did on the oceans um, ended up uh, looking at farming with water. How did, how do you view the public private partnership slash action? You were kind of for lack of a better, I mean, I'm not sure. How, how do you view your time in terms of the, the drug war? You were, you were kind of fighting a pointless-ish war with epic public funding that didn't really have good results. Yeah, so epic public funding is definitely a good way to put that. The, the amount of money that the pretty much every ISAF nation in Afghanistan was spending on counter-narcotics, I mean... I didn't know there was that much money in the world. Um, it, it was insane. I think that, and again, it's, it, it stems back to that. As humans, we see a problem and we try to solve a problem, often making it worse. I think the, the notion of trying to help humans with this addiction problem and this, um, the, some of the other things that come with illicit narcotics trade, I think that the there are people that get involved that have good intentions. And then there are people that get involved that see it as a way to control behavior. And so I think that it's a, it's a unique position to be in, but I, I think that public private partnerships can work. I think that it just needs to be done in a way where people are looking at more than just problem, symptom, solution, and looking at trying to find a sustainable solution to a greater to the underlying problem rather than just the individual symptoms and I think that our counter narcotics policy in Afghanistan was a lot of symptom based policy here's a symptom let's try to solve symptom and then by solving symptom we create four new symptoms that we then have to go back and spend more money to solve and I don't think that there's a simple solution to it. I mean, P Portugal's been doing a pretty decent job with their legalization policies and their treatment-based policies, and they're seeing a lot less of the unintended consequences of illicit narcotics as a result. Um, I think some of the ways that we're changing our views in the United States on uh, marijuana production, cultivation, even hemp, now that we're getting a little bit away from that knee-jerk reaction that hemp's a marijuana crop, so let's, um, let's ignore all of the value that that crop has. I think that we're starting to see it, and I'm hoping that that's for the better, but I'm not, I'm not in the government. I'm not a politician. I'm not a policymaker, so I was just a guy on the business end of policy. How do you view it? You're on the business end, but you're also kind of tickling that uh, B, B corporation kind of deal where you are doing something that is actually incredibly meaningful and impactful for the world. How do you think about that capitalism balance? Um, so that's also something that's developed over time. I would, uh, by the original comment on the business end of policy, I was on 
um, more, I guess, more of the pointy end of the spear of policy, which now has become, I turned it into being on the business side of it. I, after all of the things that I've done in all the places that I've done them, I really think Richard Branson said it best. Businesses can be a force for social good. Um, while I also have some, um, some attraction to Milton Friedman's policies on economics and how businesses will change behavior based on how their consumers drive them because that's what the, con the consumers are voting with their dollars and businesses will make those decisions. I think that the reality is, is that the best businesses will find a happy medium between Milton Friedman's do whatever it is to make money, letting your um, consumers vote with their dollars. And then what Richard Branson said is that um, businesses can be forces for social good. And I think that we're targeting somewhere in that hybrid model of doing both um, doing good for our customers, doing good for the planet, doing good for um, our own employees, but while also um, encouraging our consumers to be activists in their own way, because this is, you only have one life. If you don't take control of your own life one way or the other, then you're just going to end up where, wherever you are. So if you don't like what a company's doing, tell them by voting with your dollar. We want to encourage that just the same as we want to be doing the right thing on our side if any of that rambling makes sense. <laughs> makes a lot of sense. And we only have one world, which is a yeah. big part of, which is a big part of what you guys are trying to solve. Or yes. at least stewardship. Tackle. Yeah. And stewardship. I think that uh, people oftentimes think of it as possession and I think of it more as stewardship. Each generation is a steward. We're a caretaker and the best way for society and the world to continue is for all of us to be good stewards. And, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I, I make bad choices from time to time. I, I forget my review, my reusable coffee mug when I go to, to pick up a coffee on the way to a meeting sometimes. And I end up with a paper one that can't be recycled. I'm not perfect. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm here preaching that perfect, that we are perfect and we do everything right. But where, where you can consciously make decisions to be good stewards, that's what we're hoping to encourage. And that with the way that our agricultural system that we've designed is, that's what we're trying to encourage as well, is where you can do when you don't, um, you know, don't, don't think it's the end of the world. Don't go run out and beat people over the head, but just try to help everybody be good stewards. That's what we're, that's what we're hoping for. That's part of what we're hoping to disrupt in the mentality around agriculture and business as well as we, as we hopefully scale, providing we can solve the entrepreneur failure rate problem. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, what do you think of, what do you think about the whole GMO pro con push yada yada? yada? So um, that uh, comes back to what I fall, what I follow or what I try to follow is just because we can, doesn't mean we should kind of policy. I think that, uh, again, the notion of genetically modified organisms had a start in the right place. We were looking at how to make food more resilient to environmental changes, particularly in places like Africa or, you know, so we're, we're looking at hybridizing the strains. But the one thing that, um, we don't have enough data on is what are the long-term effects on the planet of these genetically modified organisms. And the scientists will tell you all day, every day that it's fine. Don't worry about it. But um, scientists also decide also thought it would be a good idea to introduce cane toads to places that cane toads weren't natural to. And now they've become an invasive species in those non-natural environments um, quite a, more than more than once uh, in Washington state's another example uh, in the central and North Cascades, we have a ton of mountain goats and the mountains are very similar to the Olympic mountains out on the peninsula um, in terms of elevation, terrain, everything else. The goats were natural to the Cascades, but they were introduced to the Olympic mountains. And for whatever reason, even that shift of not more than 60 to 75 miles and they're decimating that natural environment to the point where now we're coming back with helicopters and we're, we're knocking out goats and we're strapping them to helicopters and moving them back across from the Olympics to the Cascades at significant expense. So those anecdotes are kind of, kind of shape what I think about genetic, 
genetically modified organisms. I'm not sure. I'm not convinced that the science yet has enough data, quantitative data to say that they are completely the best course of option and that they won't create an unintended consequence that we then have to come back and spend a lot of money to fix later. And of course, there's going to be a lot of people that get mad at me for that comment. But I think that as humans, one of the things that our brains are capable of is solving a lot of problems. But I think the hardest thing that we have is understanding just because we can doesn't always mean that we should because it doesn't always mean that it's the best thing to have done. And I, I have my reticence that genetically modified organisms could potentially become one of those um, things that get out of our control that we didn't intend. Um, so I would, I would definitely agree with that. I think a lot of the pushback against GMOs has been from people that don't really understand them. My understanding is the problem isn't necessarily what you're eating. The problem is the pesticides that it enables to be used to prevent other insects from getting on and the pesticides are incredibly harmful. You don't yeah. Want and, and yes. And I mean, that's so you're, I forget the Chinese emperor um, years and years ago tried to inject himself with a little bit of mercury. Um, build some immunity, right? In order to build immunity. He was also uh, experimenting by injecting soldiers with poisons uh, little bits over time, hoping that we would then start producing soldiers with poison in our blood so that um, we could become better weapons. And the, we did end up incorporating those into those people ended up having side effects as um, even seen, there's a company that I met in 2017 in Johannesburg that is using some sort of silica based that they've modified crops with this silica, but that silica is becoming part of the very essence of those plants. And so now it's not just about what's on the plants, it's about what's in the plants. I mean, the study just came out with uh, wines and beers. Glyphosate is being found in these wines and beers that are too far removed. And um, in um, 2017, I had a conversation with the CEO of Steep Hill Laboratories, which is one of the largest producers of laboratory equipment for testing the pesticides in cannabis crops. And they did a test where they took cloned plants from outdoor grows that had were using glyphosates and other pesticides. They then removed them from that environment, cloned them six generations later, and the plants were still naturally producing glyphosate in inside of themselves. So they're not, they were, they were reproducing with glyphosate inside of the plant even after six generations so that goes right to your problem to your point is it's not necessarily the what's what we're eating on the plant necessarily it's what are we changing at the fundamental level of these plants and what's the long-term problem of, of that in and of itself and if we can't kill them with if we can spread that level of pesticide on them what are we going to do if the crop starts taking over other things? How are we going to get rid of it? That's another thing that I'm wondering. And Monsanto's in tons of lawsuits over their genetically modified seed spreading into farmers' crops down the road. And then Monsanto suing the farmers for intellectual property violation, even though they didn't plant that seed. I mean, so there, there's a ton of unintended consequences that I worry about, and I probably am more concerned about unintended consequences than most. With genetics, you can't really control them because whether it's a disease, whether it's a crop, whether it's a, a gene drive, things can get out of control fast. Uh, yeah, and life finds a way, right? They always say that life finds a way. You can go to these, you find these things where we killed it off or something, and even after a decimation uh, from fire, life finds a way. So what, what are we changing that then allows it to find a new way? I mean, bacterial resistant uh, viruses and back, or uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, they came about for a reason. They, they fixed themselves. And I mean, human, human immunity works the same. We get exposed to something, we build an immunity to it. We find a way to adapt. So we're creating these, these seeds and these plants 
to adapt to a specific thing without any knowledge base of what that adaptation will allow them to do later. Mm -hmm. and, it's, com yeah. it's complicated as well because we also have to feed the world. So you can kind of have one or the other in a lot of ways unless we fix a lot of things. Yeah, and that, like I said, I'm not, I don't think that any of the scientists that are working on it now, I don't think that their intentions are a problem. I think that they're legitimately concerned with how do we feed the world? And they're trying to do, they're using what they, their knowledge base. They have this knowledge and they're trying to give it to the world in a way that benefits the world. Um, so I don't think that they're out there intentionally trying to create this super plant that will just take over all of everything and they can make money off of it. I don't think that's their intention at all. I think they're just trying to solve that, that problem. How do we feed the world? Path to hell is paved in good intentions from both <laughs> sides. Speaking yeah. of... So you joined, you joined the Navy. What was it like being deployed? Um, so the, it, it gives perspective. It really does. Uh, and it depends on how you, depends on your own personality or where you see the world. But perspective is something that was the greatest value I got out of being in any country in the world I've ever been in. Um, and I think that it's a perspective that, again, might be controversial, but I think the Swiss had it right. Um, every adult at the time, it was every adult male right now where uh, selective service is open to both sides. Um, I think that some sort of forced service for a couple of years is a good idea because it gives us a view of the rest of the world, whether that's the job corps, the Peace Corps, the military. Mm -hmm. It gives it, it builds skills, it builds experience, and it gives us perspective that we often don't have. Um, the, the United States is one of the most interesting countries I've ever been in. We have such a diverse group of people, the state, that whole um, loose confederation of states that became slightly more federalist in nature after the Articles of Confederation didn't work. It, it gives us an even more unique perspective on the world because each state, each community is so different than, all, than some of the other areas of the world. But yet at the same time, we're so sheltered in our perspective and we forget what the rest of the world sees or how the rest of the world is or what's going on in the rest of the world because of that large scale shelter. Um, there's a, there's a food desert less than 10 miles from my house and where I within walking distance of my house, I have two major grocery stores that you can get whatever you want whenever you want. And then 10 miles away, their only pro fresh produce option is from a convenience store at a gas station. And so many people in the United States don't even know that that problem exists that close to home, let alone how the rest of the world sees it and it shapes our perspective. And so being deployed, gave me the ability to um, check my uh, perspective sometimes. And even when I might feel that I'm in the right from a moral perspective or a, um, a moral high ground or whatever else, it still gives me that, wait a minute, am I being, am I missing a, a point of view that could be important to a proper solution here or to a proper point of view? What do you think about incentive allies versus moral allies? For instance, Saudi Arabia. They couldn't be further from the U.S., but we want their oil. It's more or less what it boils down to. And it's oil and influence in the region. They're at, they, they have a strong position in the region, and so there, yeah, it's two incentives. I think that, again, humans are interesting creatures. Um, incentive and moral are oftentimes both necessities. Um, but I think that sometimes incentives can be easier to work with than moral. Um, because, uh, what movie dogma where the conversation amongst the angels and about beliefs and opinions and how one can change and the others don't, Incentives can be used to help change one side, whereas a moral position almost never changes. And um, that's where uh, in business school, I've taught this before, the difference between universalism and relativism. 
And universalism is I'm always right. Relativism is that sometimes there are other points of view that are right. And so I think that goes back to allies like Saudi Arabia is if we universalism says that we shouldn't be allies with them because they can't be further from us. Relativism says that there are reasons that we should um, still work with them and we need to find that balance. And it becomes again, tricky policy, right? How do you, how do you set the line on where the fundamental moral um, cognitive dissonance then you can deal with it to that point versus when it crosses that line. How do you set that? That, that becomes very tricky. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to the people that want to be professional policy people to, to start trying to draw that line because it, it's complicated. There's so many things to consider. Um, I mean, Iran has things that we need to be concerned with. Saudi Arabia has a fundamental disagreement with Iran. So, how long do we maintain that allied position with Saudi Arabia to help us with a potentially larger radical problem that could become from an Iran, an Iranian. They also are the biggest funders of terrorism worldwide though. So I, I'm not disagreeing with you at all on that. Um, and do, do our leaders need to have some type of concept of the military? So I've heard from a lot of people that it's frustrating that you can have some diplomat, potentially dipshit in Washington, sending boys and girls off to die overseas for X, Y, Z objective that may not actually be all that important. And they have no real concept of who these people are. That was one of the big criticisms of Hillary, honestly, was that she was willing to go to war real easy and not really willing to think about the caskets. Um, yeah, and I mean... There was criticism over John Kerry when he ran for similar reasons, even though he served at a time. And um, I remember I had friends that were in Iraq when we invaded and that we, we invaded Iraq with Humvees that had no armor. Some of them didn't even have doors um, because where those Humvees came from, that particular environment, we didn't, they didn't need doors. That wasn't something we had to worry about. So there were guys retrofitting doors onto Humvees and putting sandbags inside of the doors to protect themselves because one of the bills that John Kerry voted against, even after he came to visit, was funding to be able to upgrade some of our military technologies for the new threat environment. So that type of backseat um, or that type of not being there, not understanding fundamentally, fundamentally on the ground what we're dealing with, does that create frustration? Sure. Does it create criticism that is value that is has value? Of course it does. But at the same time, we're not a military. Um, we're not Sparta. We're not Troy. Um, you know, we're not all centered around all our military life. So we need perspective as well that isn't purely military. But at the same time, Colin Powell told you uh, said it best. The, the last people in the world that are often for advocating military intervention are the military people, uh, at least the military commanders, because they know the direct cost of it. So uh, do I think that we need leaders in place that have that perspective? Absolutely. Um, I forget the name of the guy elected in this last term, um, military guy that lost an eye. Do I think that he has controversial um, positions, sure. But is he going to know firsthand what it's going to take to vote yes to send military people to, to war? Absolutely. And do we need that perspective in there? Yes. Um, but at the same time, we need other people as well that are thinking of the things that the military people don't think of. And there are things we don't think of when, you know, the Japanese, uh, um, thing of when every when one's a hammer everything looks like a nail and that's kind of the way that we can military we can get that this is our objective this is what we have to do we're not thinking about all of the other things along the way all of the time and we need people that see those things and that's the one thing i think that society needs the most is we need all of those perspectives there's not one right answer in the, in our society there's not one view that's right and even when people 
have the right view in one area, they might have an incorrect view that we think in another. But does that mean that we should shut down their opinions all the time? No, because they still have value to add somewhere. And that's that's how I feel anyway. <laughs> I think that's a good a good summary way to think about it. One last question before we go to the bonus round. Okay. Thoughts, thoughts on Trump's position on NATO? On just the kind of splintering of what's been going on between the U.S. and the rest of the world as the U.S. becomes more isolationist? Um, isolationist policy for the United States has never, has never gone over very well. Um, you know, ask Harry Truman um, how well isolation policy worked uh, when uh, December 7th, 1942 happened. Um, you know, we tried to remain isolationist and we tried to stay out of it as much as we could and it didn't help. And the U.S. luckily is one of the few countries that has never had an all-out war fought on our own soil. And part of that has been because of the fact that we've been allies and we agree to step in and help when the problem hits someone else's forefront. And do I think that there is, again, some legitimate complaints that the Trump administration has had with our NATO allies? Sure. Are there legitimate complaints that they've had about us and how we've handled things? Of course there is. Um, but again, I think the, the most appropriate definition of compromise I'd ever heard was that if everybody doesn't leave the table feeling like they got a little screwed over, then it's not a good compromise. So I think that um, there's, valued, there's valuable criticism on both sides, but do I think that we need to go complete isolationist? No, it's a recipe for disaster because, I mean, geographically, the greatest threats in the world are going to hit other people's doorsteps before they hit ours. And if we're not willing to help them before they get to that problem, they're going to land on our doorstep. And I don't, yeah. and unfortunately you were saying, and if we're willing to mess up supply and trade, it makes all of those problems more likely to happen. Yeah, it does. And I mean, do I, do I think that uh, we need to look for, from a food perspective that we need to look at uh, more localized supply chains end to end? Absolutely. Because there's a lot of reasons that food traveling all over the world has problems. But does that mean that all trade shouldn't be well regulated in terms of regular between countries to where it works across the board? Yeah, we, we need regular trade in general. We can't produce everything that we need for our own population. None of the world can. And again, the fastest way to make sure that we end up in another war is to make sure that a country has to go to war to get resources from other people because they don't have enough on their own. And what's the greatest way to make sure that everybody has the resources they need? Trading them. So... Yeah, World War One, World War Two. I think we, we we should have figured that one out. Let's jump to the let's jump to the bonus patron episode now. Or okay, patron question. So if you guys support us at a level of five dollars or more per month, we've got some bonus questions in every episode and some bonus episodes as well. Disruptors.fm slash Patreon. First one. My question for you is: You've been through a lot. You've done a lot. What's the biggest, most transformational experience you've had? <sighs> I think that uh, that would be 2006 in Iraq. Um, we were, I was part of a DOD contracting team that was assigned to protect um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that were building schools and water projects in central Iraq, so around the Najaf area. We were stationed in Diwaniya. Um, we, it was a little tiny base. I mean there are school, there are high schools and middle schools in the United States bigger than this base we were on in the middle of nowhere in Iraq. And uh, we hadn't really had, the Army Corps of Engineers hadn't had a lot of projects. And so we were trying to keep our skills sharp and they decided one day they wanted us to make the two hour drive from the UNEA of what they called MSR Tampa at the time, which was the main north south route um, for the west coasters think of it as i5 runs it basically ran from one end of the country to the next it's just like i5 runs from basically mexico to canada and um 
for what I was supposed to be sitting in one seat one day. And for whatever reason, the team leader changed the seats. I ended up in a different vehicle sitting in a different spot. Five minutes out the gate, we took a, uh, an EFP, which is an all electrically formed projectile, which is basically somebody takes copper, makes it really thin, pounds it down to look like a speaker concave, puts a piece of explosive behind it. Susan is, or as soon as that explosive goes off, that explosive, it turns it into a projectile that looks like a really big bullet. Came through the front vehicle um, and injured um, one, of, one of my good friends. And he's uh, one of the toughest guys I've ever met, but had, he's like five foot two because of the way he had to sit in the seat. He was leaning forward just right to where the biggest piece went behind him, took out the seat behind him, a couple little pieces hit him in the arms. And he was right-handed. He has all of his limbs, but now he's left-handed. Had I been sitting in that seat because the way that I was much taller, I would have taken that big piece right into the side. And that was my normal seat for the day. And that kind of changed a lot of things in the world for me. Um, it was just a random thing that it could have been me. But then at the same time, it just the world worked out the way it was supposed to. The guy running the military hospital in Baghdad that, um, my, fr that my friend had to get evacuated to, I went to high school with him. Of all, of all the most random things, I went to high school with the guy running the hospital and was able to make sure that he was taken care of. And the, the thing that that really taught me is that life can change quickly. And so the best we can do is kind of try to be the best people we can be for ourselves, for our families, and for our friends, and for the world. And war is going to happen one way or the other. But if we can find a way to be open to more perspective in life and to change how we view things, we might have a better chance to prevent those things from happening. And so that's kind of it's kind of that transformational thing. It really changed my view on the world, and it was pretty much my last combat tour. I realized that if I was volunteering and it just wasn't worth it anymore. Fighting someone else's wars over someone else's reasons that I may or may not understand. And do they have valid gripes? I'm sure they did. Was I there for our own valid gripes? I'm sure I was, but you can't help people that aren't ready to help themselves and guns and bombs aren't, aren't, are never going to change an opinion. They really aren't. So I think that's a good place to wrap it up. I was going to ask you for a quote, a call to action, something, but I'm pretty sure you nailed like four great ones on that. It's, <laughs> uh, it's incredible. The, the near death experience that creates perspective. Is there a way anyone can do that without almost taking a bomb to the head or getting in a car crash or whatever it happens to be? I, I think there is. Um, I actually just got back from, a uh, remote wilderness uh, backpacking trip here in Washington. I just got back uh, last week. Took five days, backpacked with uh, friends up into the middle of nowhere where you can't even have a campfire and got to see the world and what's beautiful right in your own backyard. And I think that truthfully, you don't need a bomb or an explosion or a gunfight to remind you of what's awesome about the world. It can be a backpacking trip up there. It can be hanging out with some friends. It can be meeting new people and actually listening to them. We, we, have a, we have a habit of not listening to people that we don't have a um, way that we think we can connect to them. But I think that uh, listening to people can, can do that. And again, I'm not perfect. There are times when I get mad at people over the stupidest of things. And sometimes a reset like that backpack can help, you know, just say, hey, wait a minute, the world's a bigger place than me. And there are things that I can do to have a positive impact without um, getting mad over the fact that somebody cut me off in the grocery store. So and I think that's the way that you can do that is find, find your bliss, whatever it is, even if it's reading a book, listening to a podcast for 15 minutes, and it can help you change the world and change your life. I mean, Parmans.com didn't, uh, didn't come up with the slogan, change your apartment, change your world for no reason. Something, sometimes as simple as changing your surroundings can do it. You just have to have the right mindset for it. Bingo. That is perfect. 
you're helping change the mindset, change the world. Where can people find you, learn more about what you're doing? So we're uh, on all of the usuals, even though I said my piece about uh, privacy and whatnot, we have our social medias, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We also have our website, revolutionagriculture.com. Uh, you can find us there. I, admittedly, I kind of, I'm not really good at it, so I might not post that often, or you can go to the website, follow us there. Um, we've got some other people that are interested in doing some podcasts with us as well. Um, if you're from the Seattle, Washington area, King Five did a piece on us that's on their website. It's the NBC affiliate. And the more people that are involved in trying to uh, change the world through agriculture, we're, we're willing to help. We'd like to see them get involved. Yeah, we got to feed a world. We got plenty of problems and we need some people that are making big solutions happen. Thanks for coming on today, Richard. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Hope you've enjoyed it. And if you run a company or you're interested in reaching our audience, Matt at disruptors.fm. If you think that your product or service lines up with us and our core values, then maybe we can set up an advertiser deal. And again, thanks for tuning in, guys. Until next time, go make it happen. Eat something awesome and build something better. Cheers.